personal spoops, green texts, and otherwise creepy stories thread. Check the catalog and didn't see a thread like this. I was hoping to have a good old-fashioned spooky stories thread. The reason is that I'm going to be on a paranormal podcast soon, and the host asked me to bring some personal stories, or stories from people I know. As I was thinking about some of them, I decided I could share them. They're not great, really, but maybe others will join in and we can get a campfire going. Once I'm out of stuff, I might post some green texts, too. That said, I'll begin in the next post. For your information, I've shared a few of these before in random threads. I'm going to start with a simple one that is shared on my dad's side of the family. Dad lives with brothers and sisters in the deep south. Very rural area, raised by very strict parents. One day they get it into their heads to summon the devil. It's the middle of the day, and I guess they don't have much to do, so they go out near the woods and find a quiet spot where they won't be disturbed. They sit in a circle, holding hands, and start concentrating on seeing the devil in the center of the circle. After a bit, my dad's oldest sister calls out for the devil to show himself. Right before their eyes they see a swirling ball that looks like sort of like it's made out of fire. Dad's ears go deaf and the fireball circles upwards, over their heads and then shoots off down the tree line and disappears. Dad and siblings take off running back to the house and tell their parents what happened. Grandpa beats Dad for summoning the devil Keck. The cool thing about this story was that all my uncles and aunts are still living, and all have confirmed it happened. Both my grandpa, R.I.P., and grandpa also remember this particular day. Like I said, it's not much, but it's a real story that I've heard all my life growing up. Remember my dad's fireball story reminded me of the Marfa lights. I used to see them nearly every night during a two-week period while I was working out there. Work involved clearing out this huge stretch of open ranchland and building things for an upcoming wedding. Job was from 6 a.m. to whenever the hell our boss told us to stop, usually about a 14-hour shift. This was every day, so we'd usually be worn out by the end of the day. Would end up just sitting out there staring off into the mountains at the end of the day. I had a best friend that I worked with and we'd usually crack open a beer and watch the lights. This guy was originally from Mexico. He told me Mexicans believe the lights are witches that fly around in the form of a fireball. But some people say the lights are a sign pointing to buried treasure, very common belief down in Mexico apparently. Find this very interesting because of an old story involving my grandpa. This is another story that is well known in my family, but it comes from mom's side. Grandpa took in this kid whose family basically abandoned him. Kid was fiercely loyal to my grandpa as a result. He heard about the lights, and wanted to see if the legends of buried treasure were true. He thought he owed it to my grandpa for taking him in, or something like that. So one night the kid disappears. Grandpa is wondering where he went, a nervous wreck. Kid returns, and he's clearly spooked. He tells Grandpa a weird story, I'll refer to this kid as Albert from this point on. Albert waited till it got dark and kept his eyes on the mountains. He saw one of the lights appear and he went up the mountain towards it. He found the spot where the light was, it looked like a fire. He would brought a shovel with him and dug under it. He found a huge satchel loaded with gold. Heaved it up out of the ground and began hurrying down the mountain, should have mentioned that the treasure is supposed to be cursed. Albert's anxious to get off the mountain, but he's feeling proud of himself for finding the gold. He's about to set foot of the mountain when he finds himself stuck. Feels like someone is holding him in place, like a person wrapped their arms around him. He hears a voice whispering to him and he's looking around but there's no one there. The voice keeps whispering and squeezing and Albert is trying to wriggle free from the invisible grip. As he does, he drops the satchel. Instantly, he's able to move freely again. He takes off running back towards my grandpa's ranch. Comes in clearly spooked, 
and tells my grandpa this story. Grandpa is livid, but curious about what the voice was whispering to Albert. Albert is visibly shaking, and stutters, all or nothing. From that point on Albert had a stutter, and eventually he lost the ability to speak. I met him as a kid and he was a total mute. Grandpa said he thought the voice was saying that Albert had to take every piece of gold buried in the mountains, or none of it at all. Till the day he died he believed that there must be way more gold buried up in those mountains than anyone thinks, and often talked about going up there with a crew, but never did. I'm Indian American. My family lived in the States but we would go to India every summer to visit relatives. Up until this point we had always stayed in Bangalore and made day trips to a village not far outside the city to visit my uncle's family. In 2017, when I was 16, they invited us to stay with them in their village near Malayanagiri, a mountain, for a few weeks and make day trips to Bangalore instead. My parents figured why the hell not, it would give us more family time and would be less noisy and busy than the city. Now my uncle's son, Pratap, was fairly rebellious and had rejected his parents' attempts to arrange a marriage for him with a girl from the same village and caste for years. He didn't want an arranged marriage, he wanted a love marriage and he held out for years having one brief chaste relationship after another with girls from Bangalore that never went anywhere and fizzled out before reaching a point where he could introduce them to his family. By this point he was desperate, and at least partly driven by horniness to find a wife. It seemed he might soon give in to his parents' wishes and meet with a girl they thought would be a good match for him. However, after they arranged for the two to meet, he had cancelled on them and told them he found a girl named Rupina, he was serious about, and that he wanted them to meet her instead. This all came about, my parents said, because Pratap had seen his older sister Suvarita married off in an arranged marriage to a man that at first had seemed kind and upstanding, but had later been outed as a violent alcoholic. He killed her and then himself one evening after she chastised him for his heavy drinking, just a few years prior. Pratap didn't want to make a mistake by marrying a chameleon. We got there while this was unfolding, after he had cancelled and before the meeting with his new GF. It was late at night when we got into the village after taking a taxi from Bangalore, which had itself followed a non-stop flight from Chicago into Bangalore. My dad and mom set up in a spare room and I got the couch. It was dead quiet at night out there. The houses weren't separated by much distance but most of the folks were very conservative farmers who slept early and woke early. That first night's sleep was blissful. In the morning I went with my dad down to the corner store to buy a few essentials like toothbrushes and toothpaste, as well as some of his favorite treats, like peanut chicky, and on the way back he remarked that my cousin's new GF was coming over for breakfast with my cousin and would probably be there when we got back. We passed our uncle on the way back delivering our dirty laundry, and their own, to the local doby, washer, man. He told us Pratap was home with his girlfriend and to expect breakfast. Sure enough, when we got back the smells of masala dosa, idli, vada and black tea greeted us along with a woman we had never seen before. A beautiful woman, well out of my cousin's league. She was standing beneath the tree in my aunt and uncle's small yard that Pratap, his sister, and I had all played on when we were young kids during my summer day trips to their village. Pratap was there with her, and they were talking with my aunt. The first few minutes I laid eyes on this woman are seared into my memory alongside a peculiar feeling. Looking back, it was her intense stare that stood out the most. When she looked at you, her eyes and the expression they wore seemed to move freely of the rest of her face. Like how you can tell a fake smile when a person doesn't smile in the eyes. Her fashion was out of place too, she was wearing boots, which was unusual for anybody over there. She had a sweet soft voice, and was friendly and extroverted, but she was always clinging to my cousin, her arm looped around his, almost as if she was using him to balance. She seemed uncomfortable on her own two feet. Within minutes, the peculiar feeling was gone and I felt pretty enamored with this bubbly, beautiful woman. I don't remember much of the first conversation over breakfast except that it was the usual hodgepodge of questions that Indian parents ask their children's potential spouses. Where did you go to school? What do you do for a living? How much do you earn? And of course what is your caste? My uncle and aunt are fairly liberal-minded people for village-dwelling Indians, owed partly to the fact that they had been previously in Bangalore for their education as young people before returning. 
they didn't mind this woman's answers to their questions, and they didn't mind her different, lower caste. I remember a lot of friendly discussion and laughter. Her laughter mostly, extremely sweet and inviting. I soon forgot her strangeness, and felt a twinge of jealousy over my cousin's relationship with this beautiful, sweet girl. The one thing I do remember very clearly, because I saw it for myself and because my father remarked upon it, was that my cousin looked tired, sleepless even, and it showed a lot on his face. Bags under his eyes, faint wrinkles, and so forth. My father asked him if he'd been getting enough sleep, wink, wink, nudge nudge, and my uncle hushed my father. Pratap just replied that he had been sleeping extremely well and he must just need to freshen up a bit. When they left around noon, my uncle and aunt remarked that she seemed very sweet and a good match for my cousin, but that they think he should meet the girl they had set up for him first before he makes a decision. My dad wasn't really interested in his nephew's love life and made plans for us all to find a restaurant in the village to eat, or else we would take a taxi back into Bangalore and then rickshaw around looking for a good place to get our grub. My uncle said there would be no need for that, there was a little outdoor market in the village where we could get lunch so that's what we did. We stayed there most of the day chatting about nothing important and enjoying the fresh air and when we got back to my uncle's house the sun was setting. We had been eating all day so none of us was hungry, so we had some tea and relaxed in front of the TV watching ridiculous Kannada movies. Near midnight my uncle and dad retired to bed and I turned off the TV and curled up on the couch not long after. My aunt and mom were long asleep. It couldn't have been any later than 3 in the morning when I woke up and needed to take a piss. Their bathroom wasn't inside, like many Indian village homes they had an outhouse with a floor toilet like the kind that is common across Asia. I stumbled out into the quiet dark and clumsily slammed shut and latched the door of the outhouse behind me, hoping I didn't wake anyone sleeping inside. I relieved myself and turned around to unlatch the the wooden door to the outhouse and beat my retreat back inside when I saw movement through the gap in the door. In the faint light of the moon I caught a glimpse of the color and texture of brown skin through the gap, and could tell the movement was very near the door. The next moment the same moonlight illuminated an eye peering through the gap as whoever was standing on the other side attempted to pull it open. I heard a raspy, high-pitched woman's voice say something in Canada that I couldn't quite make out. I was so startled by the gaze of a stranger and the sudden, forceful attempts to yank the door open that I yelled out loudly, what the hell, and must have woken up my father, because I heard the door to the house open again and he came out asking if I was alright. The I, and whoever it belonged to, had vanished into the night. I unlatched the outhouse door when I heard my father's voice nearby and stumbled over to the porch where he was standing. He asked me what was up and I relayed to him the encounter I had just had. He cocked an eyebrow while listening and then said you were probably just half asleep. By this point the adrenaline was wearing off and I asked him about what I thought the figure on the other side of the door had said to me. Sundara. I didn't speak any Kannada, I regret not learning, but my parents never spoke it at home except in India. My dad told me it means handsome and laughed. Even in your nightmares the girls are eager. I didn't find his jokes about it funny, and I was still shaking a bit from the encounter. We went back in, locked the door, and went back to sleep. It took me an hour to fall back asleep, aided by the last remaining bits of jet lag. The next morning Pratap came over for breakfast again, this time without his GF. He looked even more haggard than before, like he had been under an extreme amount of stress. In his hair I caught the glimmer of a bit of grey. His parents asked him to meet with the girl they thought would be good for him, and after much cajoling he finally relented and was convinced. My uncle asked him where his GF was and he said she had gone back to her village up Malayanagiri for a few days to see her parents. My parents and his parents exchanged skeptical glances. After Pratap left, I asked them what that had been all about and that's when my aunt and uncle told me, that there are no villages up Malayanagiri and that Pratap must have misheard his GF. I shrugged, but my parents seemed uneasy when before they had been fairly light-hearted. The meeting my aunt and uncle set up for the coming Saturday was three days off. The day before the meeting my aunt and uncle received a frantic, shrill phone call, that I later learned was from the mother of the woman Pratap was to meet. She was in a panic and crying as she asked my aunt if she had seen her daughter recently. It turns out the daughter had gone for a walk to the village well earlier in the day, and had not returned. Her bucket was found overturned beside the well, its water spilled. 
In the mud near the exterior of the well, were found a single pair of footprints, leading away from the well. The village headman was going house to house and organizing us into a search party. Pratap was at home at this time and we all joined in the search but turned up nothing. The disappearance of this girl cast a shadow over our trip, and we felt uneasy staying in the village so my dad made arrangements for us to leave on Monday. It was Friday night. Pratap left early the next morning before I got up, as his GF was back in the village and the two of them took his moped into Bangalore. It was a nearly five-hour trip, but he could not be dissuaded despite the recent tragedy. We watched him ride off to pick her up and figured we wouldn't see him again until after we had made our way to Bangalore. I told my dad I was going out to the corner store for some soda and chips. He gave me a few hundred rupees, barely interrupting his conversation with his brother, and away I went. About halfway there I saw something that gave me reason to pause. Rupina was walking arm in arm with a man I had never met, a very old man, quite a bit older than Pratap. She locked eyes with me, smiled, and waved before saying something to the old man before he shambled off. I was fixed in place as she approached me, now more aware than ever of how drop-dead gorgeous she was. My heart was racing from the excitement of merely being near her. She greeted me and I asked her what she was doing in the village as I thought she had gone to Bangalore with Pratap, but she told me they had stopped for drinks for the road first, and that he was waiting for her. I asked her who that man was, and she told me he was her father. I didn't have any reason to doubt her and it made sense to my horny distracted 16-year-old brain so I just nodded and she patted me on the shoulder and stumbled off. But there was something else I had noticed, that I began to notice even more as she walked further from me. Her gait was awkward and unnatural, like she had trouble taking each step. I stared after her for the longest time when suddenly, after a bit, she turned back to look and I felt my blood curdle at the expression on her face. Because there was no expression. It was as if her eyes were dead and the muscles in her face had been completely relaxed. Everything drooped. But I remember the face she wore when she saw that I was looking. It transformed into the most sinister, wolf-like stare I had ever seen, as the skin pulled back well beyond its normal tautness. I felt myself transfixed as she stumbled awkwardly forward, all the while staring back at me until she turned down a far street and disappeared behind some distant houses. I didn't dare turn my back until she vanished. Then I booked it back home empty-handed. When I stumbled inside I found my parents and aunt and uncle in an excited state. My uncle was holding an axe and, to my surprise, Pratap was there. They were heatedly discussing something in Kannada for a few minutes before they noticed I was home. It was then that my parents filled me in. Pratap had not gone to Bangalore with Rupina. He had left on his moped to pick her up for the trip but had caught her in the company of another lover, a man much older than himself. They had argued and she told him he would get over it soon enough and accept her for who she is. She told him that her love with Adesh was true love like what they had and he should understand. Pratap, upon hearing this, had come running back home and left her there with the old man. Then my uncle informed me that the much older man, Adesh, was the name of a teenage boy who had gone missing from the village just two years before after he went up Malayana Jiri by himself one afternoon. That upon hearing of his decrepit, elderly appearance, and bearing in mind Pratap's more and more haggard look, they had finally asked him if he had been sexually active with Rupina, which he replied in the affirmative. They then knew. Knew what? I was left hanging for a moment before my uncle told me that Rupina was not a living woman. The way she walked, her uncanny beauty, and the way that any man who touched her ripened like a fruit left out in the sun, gave away her true nature. She was a hurl, the vengeful spirit of a wronged woman. And they were going to kill her. Either they were very crazy or they were very right, and I was torn between both possibilities. I voiced my doubts and my uncle glanced out the window at the tree in their yard. The same tree that Suvarita, Pratap, and I had climbed and laughed on together as children. He showed me the axe in his hand. We will find out the truth soon enough. And out the front door he went, making a beeline for the tree where he swung the axe back and then toward the tree. I shit you not, the moment that axe wedged itself into the trunk of that tree, a shrill wailing started up in the distance toward the mountain. This only seemed to further excite my uncle as he swung furiously at the groove in the tree again and again, until he had nearly worn through it. With each swing the wailing drew closer, 
but was still distant enough that we could not witness its source. The wailing was at its height now and some villagers, including the headman, had gathered to watch my uncle cut down the tree. I'm sorry Suverita, I'm so sorry. Forgive me, forgive me. He kept saying in Kannada, later translated by my father to me. When the tree was felled the wailing stopped abruptly and my uncle, covered in sweat, collapsed at the stump and cried. His wife joined him and they cried together there. Thankfully, nothing else came up over the rest of the weekend and on Monday we took a taxi into Bangalore. We did not see Rupina again before we left, and as far as we know she was not seen in the village again after we had gone. We didn't make any more trips out to the village while we were there, and I haven't been back to India since. I saw my aunt and uncle one last time when they came to Bangalore with Pratap to see us off the day of our flight back. Last I heard, Pratap is happily married to a woman from the same village, of the same caste, in a union arranged by their parents. Continuing with another story. But first, thank you to, to the Anon who shared the story from India. Fascinating read and a hard act to follow. I won't attempt to have anything as good as that. But I will reiterate that all the ones I'm sharing here are actual stories I've heard directly from people I trust. Some will probably sound made up, but they're not. Here's a basic one. I have an aunt. She lives alone with my little cousin. One day we went to visit her and she casually mentions that several years ago she saw a ghost. She goes on to say that this was several years back, when my cousin was just a newborn. She was home alone when she heard something that sounded like a person on her front porch. The whole area around her house is cement, so it was a very clear clicking sound, like someone with dress shoes or high heels walking around the porch. She could hear it from her bedroom window because her room was very close to the front door. She got a little nervous, being a single mother with a newborn and all, so she she very carefully glanced outside through her curtains. So let me describe the scene. Aunt's window looks out onto a solid gray wall. A full moon is illuminating the wall. My aunt hears the clicking of someone walking around. Then it begins to move towards her bedroom window. As the clicking grows closer, a shadow appears on the wall opposite her window. It moves past, as though somebody is walking by, but there's nobody there. Aunt watches, silently freaking out, as the shadow moves past the room, and out of sight around the corner of the house. She walks over to the window that faces the street. Looks outside. The shadow is now clearly moving down the road. Clicking of footsteps following it. But there's not a soul in sight. Be me. Nashville 2017. If you know anything about the city, you'll know that it was around this time it started getting big. What's important to note is that before this, the city was a near perfect blend of rural and urban, not everywhere, but a lot of places. I lived in a suburb where driving 15 minutes in opposite directions would take you either downtown, or into natural reserve territory, it was in this suburb I had my first legitimate spiritual encounter, and I will die on the hill that I didn't imagine any of it. Be brother. Fine free 90 style TV. Beaten up but pleasant aesthetic. Mom doesn't want it in the house, hide it in the backyard until coming to decision on what to do with it. Backyard nothing but thick copses of trees and nature. Remember, depending on where you live there's a perfect blend of city and nature, it wasn't uncommon for some neighborhoods to be divided by thick patches of legitimate forest. Eventually come to the decision to hide it in forest. Secrate forest hideout dot secrecy. Wait until nightfall to move it cause hoa is trash. Nightfall. Join brother to hide it in forest. Halfway through backyard when. Something's wrong. We'll continue in next post cause it's my first time telling this story with green text, not sure about the word limit. Feel something's wrong. Brother what are you talking about? Seriously, be quiet. Everything is silent on a humid summer's night. No bugs, no wind, no people, no crickets. Something is seriously out of place. Distinctly feel like we're being watched, but there are no neighbors out at 11 p.m. Feel multiple pairs of eyes, 
start looking around. Nothing around. Brother starts talking again and tell him to be quiet. Do you feel that? We're being watched. No, we're not. Keep looking around because something is watching us, multiple somethings. Feel chills up my spine and goosebumps. Few seconds later. The most stereotypical fog rolls in, wide, covers vision, but not thick enough to not see through. Something is seriously not right, start panicking cause I can't find the source. As quickly as it came in, fog disappeared. Couldn't have been more than a minute. When it disappears, reveal the location of the staring. I distinctly remember it and my description hasn't changed in the years since this took place. To one side of our house, next to a tree lining, was what I could only describe as an inky group of malevolent entities. I remember staring at that patch of darkness and seeing this group's eyes piercing through my brother and I, their stares felt oily, inky, and dark. That is the most apt description I can give of how it felt being stared at by them. Almost as important was that I could tell they were malevolent, I could tell they meant to cause harm to my brother and I. What they were going to do, and when, I had no idea, but I know for a fact they meant us harm. Stare at the entities. Brother is mildly freaking out cause he can't sense them and I'm acting borderline schizo. Why haven't they hurt us? As soon as the thought enters my mind, another group above the tree lining reveals themselves. At least three times bigger than malevolent spirits. Saw the group as they kept the entities at bay. Guarding my brother and I from their harm. Two groups. Standing there menacingly. This is a spiritual cold war. Who's going to give first? After that incident, I remember looking at games like Final Fantasy or any RPGs that have you fighting spirits slash gods and laughing. Standing before the two groups, I remember as clear as day I had zero amounts of fear for the simple reason I couldn't comprehend what was in front of me. I knew what I was looking at, but I couldn't comprehend just how otherworldly these things were, I couldn't grasp their immensity, like recognizing infinity, but only as a concept. You don't know how deep infinity really is. Malevolent group staring at us. Defending group staring at them. Continued for what felt like hours, was most likely 40 to 60 seconds. Malevolent groups vanishes like a wisp. Defending group watched them leave, stuck around for another 10 seconds to make sure they were gone. Leave. Crickets come back. Tell brother we'll put the TV in the woods tomorrow. What? No, let's do it now. I'm not tempting that group to come back, we're going back inside. Left TV in the open. Being raised Baptist, I think those were demons and angels respectively. My brother once asked me what I would have done had he ignored my warnings and kept walking, and I told him I'd have choked him out. It sounds edgy, but that's the only time I've ever said anything like that to him, because it was a legitimate cold war between them. If we did something stupid, I'm not sure what would have happened aside from a dreadful certainty that our lives would have been in legitimate danger. To this day, what astounds me most was the distinct lack of fear, I really couldn't grasp just how deep those entities were. Maybe others have had similar feelings, maybe different, but that was mine. I posted a thread about this before but it never got much attention. Be my grandfather. Mother needs to be picked up on the other side of town one night in the 90s when she was young. He gets in his car and leaves to go get her. Comes back, pulls in driveway. Car engine shuts off. Massive aura of light appears over his vehicle and lights up the ground around the car. Trying and trying but car still won't start. White dots start appearing everywhere, on the dash, the seats, everywhere inside the car, like a disco sort of. To me it seems like some sort of scan. Pop was pissing himself in laughter because he didn't have a clue what was going on and thought the whole situation was funny. Wasn't even afraid, because at the moment he didn't think it was anything extraordinary. Light fades and goes away. Car is able to start again. Grandmother was watching from the window and said it looked like a spaceship. Still amazes me every time he tells it over the beer. Go to visit grandparents' grave. Do this once a year. From Florida so I drive to Wisconsin. 
cemetery is situated between Cudahy and South Milwaukee. Go there, see new faces of the workers. They all seem off, except for a big dude with a beard. He's cool, always polite. Go to grandparents' grave, see their marker has sunken. Apologize to grandparents, been busy. Turn around, big guy's there with some tools. Apologizes profusely and says he'll raise the marker. Ask if he knew about it. Says no, an old woman asked him to do it. I'm creeped out because no one was in the cemetery but the workers and I let him do his work, and head to my car. Car smells like grandma's perfume. Not so creepy but spooky. Spooky. Those beings remind me of a, a thread from a few weeks back, I think. A forest ranger mentioned that in the woods where he worked, he and his colleagues frequently saw black shadowy figures which he also described as inky. Specifically he called them inky black humanoids. Also, semi-related, but I have a number of friends who have seen black shadowy entities. Mexican friend from El Paso. Grew up seeing the hat man. Had never heard of him though, she just told me the stories and I explained to her that it was an entity that people all over the world report seeing. She told me she never thought he was scary, just interesting, and she found his appearances. Cool. Another friend originally from England. Grew up seeing tall black humanoid shadows in her house. They walked hunched over because they were so tall they touched the ceiling. She and her sister both saw them multiple times. Again, never frightened, just thought it was strange. Another friend from Texas. He grew up very poor, but had a friend who lived in an old two-story house. Went often after school. Frequently saw shadows moving in his peripheral vision. His friend tells him that the shadows are like little people. He's seen them before but you have to be quick to catch them as they move. They spend an afternoon watching out of the corner of their eyes and trying to catch the shadows as they zip by. Friend times it perfectly a couple of times and sees the shadows straight on. They look like weird little triangles, almost like black shadowy stars. But they feel like people somehow. Here's one that happened to me last year. CW means Morse code for you non-ham radio fags. One night in early October, firing up the 80 meter. 80 is primarily a night band and I'm a night owl. Made a couple contacts here and there, but spent most of my time listening. Called CQ on 3.560, the QRP CW calling frequency, and got nothing. Had a rather silly random wire antenna hooked up and was really just playing around, not expecting much. Few minutes went by and called again. Before I finished punching out my call sign, someone came back to me, very quickly. They didn't even let me finish my transmission, but they copied my call correctly. Couldn't copy down what they were saying right away, but it was repetitive. It was a call sign, and they sent it at least 20 times in a row. Very rapidly, along with what I could only describe as a bunch of CW gibberish. CAA, MON, and weird shit like that. He was keying too fast, I couldn't copy it, I'm good at CW but I've never heard anything like it, what I could copy was bizarre and disjointed. Didn't reply, it was super strange and for some reason gave me a kind of nervous. Ominous feeling. Grabbed my phone and went to QRZ to look up the call sign that had been repeatedly sent. Heart fell to my feet when I looked this guy up, he friggin died in August. Here someone was shooting CW at me faster than I've ever, ever heard, using a dead man's call sign. Freaked me right TF out. I shut the radio off. His call was, K5ALU, his obituary said he was one of the fastest CW operators in the US. I have no reason to make any of this up. And maybe someone was pirating his call sign, but it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. I sort of wish I'd have tried to actually make contact, or at least deciphered more of what whoever it was saying. I want to share a funny one if that's okay. It's one of those I was the spoop stories. In fifth grade. Friend and I are super into, scary stories to tell in the dark. 
we decide it would be funny to come up with our own ghost story and freak everyone out. So we make up a story about the school bathroom being haunted. In my school, the fifth grade bathroom was the only bathroom that was all by itself. We'd ask a teacher to go, then come back and lie to the other boys about having seen a ghost. I told them I heard a disembodied voice. My friend said he felt someone touch him. Then we elaborate the story and say that the previous year, some kid had done the Bloody Mary ritual in the school bathroom and gone missing. Supposedly Bloody Mary snatched him and pulled him into the mirror, and now he's trapped in there. So it was just all of this fake lore that we made up. But the other kids start believing it because we keep insisting that it's all real. Pretty soon, other kids are coming back from bathroom breaks shaken up, claiming to have heard voices in there. Everybody's got their own story. Then shit starts hitting the fan. People start getting too scared to use the bathroom alone. One kid gets caught pissing in the coat closet to avoid going by himself. Another kid shits his pants trying to hold it until recess. Shit like this is happening in every 5th grade class. Teachers get us all together one day and demand to know who started the rumor about the haunted bathroom. Nobody can even remember that it was me and my friend because they've all been making up their own stories by this point. A Jehovah's Witness kid gets pulled out of school because his parents think something demonic is happening at the school. Bathroom mirrors are found shattered one day. Some kid apparently went in and broke them all. Thought it would get Bloody Mary and the missing kid to leave us all alone. School had to pay to get it all repaired many cakes this one could be just being retarded but still stumps me and anything i decide i feel would just be cope because i don't have a concrete idea of what happened be me cat sitting for my sister keep cat in the spare bedroom because he doesn't like my cats i live at home still get a bad feeling just a baseless worry but i check anyway mfw he's not here check every corner of that room it's not a big room. Under the blankets in the closet in the window. No cat. Okay he escaped let's go look for him. Check all over the house, none of my cats are on edge. Still can't find him, so I decide to try to scare him out of wherever he is. Grab a broom and start slapping it around, all the rooms of the house, under beds, under tables, against walls. No cat. Okay maybe he's somehow hidden in the room he's supposed to be in. Repeat my broom procedure in the room. What the hell he's nowhere here. Repeat broom slap across the house again. Be that baseless feeling happens again. Feels like this is all just too stupid, so I say screw it. Grab the broom and slam it down like Gandalf and say give me the cat back. Finish searching the living room again. Go back into his room, he's sleeping on the bed. Am I crazy or did I save the cat? He's an asshole, but he started opening up to me a little before this happened. Be 12 years old. Eat at grandma's house. Every day. From Monday to Friday for years now. Grandma's health would suddenly go to shit after last December, it is March now. She's in bed. Every day is a torture with thoughts of receiving a phone call telling us that she passed away. My aunts start getting together after not seeing each other for months, they decide to do guards besides my grandma. Carry on with school, my first year in middle school, pretend everything's fine. My grades had been getting really good for months now. Be kinda distant with grandma despite her being in her literal deathbed. Weeks pass by, April comes and I get Easter vacations. My mother would do her guards on Friday, and my sister and I would spend this day of the week going out, eating junk food or doing whatever to escape. It was the last Friday of school, vacation started that day, next Saturday it was my father's birthday. Night comes, my grandma's health gets even worse. She might not make it through the night. All my aunts and uncles gather. I sleep on a couch. I dream about a young adult version of me. I'm with some friends that I don't frigging know who they are, but apparently my dream me did know them. We're coming out of an apartment into a red car, 
each of us dressed with blue jeans and a colored hoodie, red, blue, purple and I'm wearing a green one. I notice a presence looking at us from a telephone pole just across the street. It is long and dark. Was it a person? I can't really remember. Ignore it, I know what it means. Suddenly the dream goes like a movie into his POV, I can see myself and the group getting into the car. I lock the door to the apartment and head to the car but I feel the entity approaching, I freeze in the spot. I feel it slowly approaching and extending its hand until it is right about touch my shoulder. Wake up to the hand on my shoulder, it's my sister full of tears. F me. She's dead, Anon. Was it her trying to say goodbye? I don't know. Picarel is something my friend and I saw just over two years ago, changed my life. Pasting from another thread. Had visual snow all my life, relevant. It's just a fey layer of TV static over my vision. Never really think much of it. Nice spring day, having smoke in the garden. Taking with best mate, just having a laugh. A weird feeling comes over me like a stranger put their hands on my shoulders. I look over at my mate, and suddenly he looks really, really clear. At first I didn't understand what I was seeing, then I realized. For the first time ever I was seeing him without static in the way. The static was still present, but it was gathered around him quite strongly. It's his frigging aura. I can see it emanating around him, crackling static like fire. I come straight out and tell him, asks if he can see mine. For some reason I just know he'll see mine too if he concentrates. He looks at me confused, thinks him schizo. Describe what I'm seeing carefully and ask him to please just try see. He hesitates, but agrees. Hess a good friend. He squints for a moment, looking around me for the crackling static what described. He pauses a moment, his eyes widen. He sheds a friggin' tear and says I can see yours too. Before this moment he was a hardcore atheist that thought magic was silly. I hug him, Hess my bro and this is a person story get over it. Mid hug, we somehow feel compelled to look up. The static in the air seems to open up, as if something was coming through the other side. Picarel appears in its full glowing glory, we both saw it. It was a band of light suspended in the air, it faced you full on no matter what angle you looked at it from. It didn't do anything but sit in the air. Mate says it was there for 10 minutes, I thought it couldn't have been more than 3. In any case it was defiantly an interdimensional experience, time moved weirdly for both of us. After a while it seemed to disappear as if it was water going down a drain. Just. Glump. Do you still have the static now? In fact I do. I've always had it, but that experience made me see there was more to it. It's not always anything of note but it's certainly always there. And are you still able to see auras? Occasionally, yes. It's just been two years for me, and I've only ever gotten glimpses. I can see the static slash shape easily but I find it hard to distinguish colors sometimes it just sorta comes out of people when they're emotional. My dad is a great example of someone with a clearly visible aura. He's been through a lot of shit in his life and at some point 20 years ago he decided he was just going to be honest to himself and others no matter what. At the start it made his life kinda crummy but it slowly but surely made him and his life a lot happier and brighter and now he's just a thoughtful, happy-go-lucky, super honest guy. His heart is just out in the open, you know? Every so often he'd tell me about growing up by the Irish countryside, fishing with his dad, hunting with his granddad. He'd smile wide and his aura would flame around his head like a lion's mane. Three short spoops, possibly related to each other these were from 2016 to 2017 ish. In my bathroom, washing hands. Look up into mirror, stare for a few seconds at self. Suddenly see the shower curtain moving in the reflection. Quickly turn around, it was defiantly moving. No windows open, all doors shut, not near any vents, no AC, fan or heater on. A few nights later. 
sitting on bed on laptop. Home alone. Have these decorative Zelda potion bottles in the corner of my room. One of the corks goes flying off the bottle landing halfway across the room. Literally just dyed water in the bottles, no pressure buildup of any kind could happen. A week or so later. Downstairs in kitchen, everything is clean and tidy. Go upstairs and turn out lights to get ready for bed. Reach top of stairs. Hear loud ass bang. Kinda spooked. Go back down and turn on all lights. Search around where the sound came from. Nothing on floor, nothing broken, nothing out of place. Spend 10 or so minutes trying to figure out what could have caused noise. Cannot figure out what it would have been. Checked fridge and cabinets too just in case something fell. Nothing else happens. We built that house from the ground up in an HOA, and moved out a few years later. Nothing else happened after those events. I figure I might as well tell my story. Never actually written a green text so bear with me. Late 2000s, at least 07. At a sleepover with school friends. Doing typical teen boy shit. Halo, COD, Gao, good times. Have one friend super into spiritual beings, claims to have summoned his guardian angel before. He offhandedly suggests we try summoning something. Everyone's on board except for me. I come from a hardcore Christian family, I won't mess with spiritual beings at all. They go whatever and start looking up demons to summon. After debate, they settle on a succubus, to be expected from teen boys. Turns out friend who suggested it brought all these supplies like chalk, candles, and a goofy mall ninja knife. They draw all these symbols on the floor and wait. Nothing. Mildly disappointed at the lack of demon titties, they go back to Halo 3. Later we go to bed, my bag was closest to the now erased symbols, with my face's right side near a smear. Wake up at like 4 o'clock to the feeling of breath on my cheek, at first I think it's a prank. I try to turn, but can't move. I start to panic, but I can't even squirm. Start smelling an overpoweringly sickly sweet wine smell. I finally wake up. It's almost 11 o'clock. WTF. Try to brush it off as a nightmare. Since then, every dream I've had is full of that friggin' smell. Moral of the story, don't sleep near a summoning ritual, especially if the spiritual being is your opposite in some way. I'm sure I got off easy with just a smell, but yeah. Watch out. Be me a couple years ago. Sleeping. Dreaming that I'm in my living room and everything is dark and bluish. Get a weird feeling and start running towards my bedroom. Right as I'm running through my bedroom doorway I trip and fall onto my bed, and when I land the bluish tint. Immediately vanishes and it's bright like daytime. Think that I just woke up from a dream, but realize I can't move. Laying on my right side, I see next to my bed a huge hole in the floor. Get the feeling that something evil is in that hole and climbing fast towards the top to get out. Feel that it would be catastrophic for the world slash reality if this thing got free, but can't do anything because I'm paralyzed. Right when the thing is about to come out of the hole, my field of vision starts to look like a piece of film being burned, only as this daytime view of my bedroom burns slash fades away it is replaced by the exact same view of my bedroom but dark. Suddenly I can move again and realize I am truly awake now, but don't feel like anything that just happened was a dream, it seems like I was awake for all of it. One of my weirdest experiences, though I've had a few other ones. I still wonder what the thing in the hole was, and if it got free or not. Not good at green texts, please bear with me. This story takes place last summer in July. Be me 21 at the time. Grew up and live on the Jersey Shore. Be best friends 21 birthday we decide to hang out during the afternoon and then party later. We drive around looking for someone to hang out with but we didn't plan shit ahead so we decide to buy some booze for later and go to the bay to fish. I don't really like fishing as much as most people here do but my friend did and I figured even if I just sat there I could still entertain him. Friend brought weed too so he could drive back to my house later. 
light up at the bay grab our rods and go out onto the docks. It's just a little marshy beach the size of the circle end of a cul-de-sac. Be about 10 minutes in, imbaked, I don't smoke often. Wind picks up a bit not like hurricane speeds but just normal calm wind. I start hearing a sound similar to humming, kind of like singers when they harmonize. Not too high pitch but not low either. It wasn't loud at first, then it started getting louder and louder, until I couldn't stand because I was afraid I'd trip and fall in the water. Doc has plastic benches screwed into it, so I sit down and am just doing my best to not shit myself, while it's still getting louder, by the end it was like that grand harmonizing sound I imagine you would hear in front of the pearly gates. LOL. It calms down eventually, the whole experience probably lasted like 5 minutes max. Ask friend if he heard that loud ass humming, he squinted at me and said no. So I just dropped it. Start getting the urge to start fishing. Sounds dumb but whenever I've gone fishing in the past I'd always try until everyone else got real into it then go and do something else. No second thoughts grab my rod and start casting. Instantly realize I'm throwing my line further out than I ever have. After I get my line reeled in, I keep repeating that, getting further and further and I was having a blast. Friend says he's gonna go smoke some more in the car, because there was a family there also on the other end of the docks. Say okay and keep casting, I don't know, if I even looked away from the sea when I replied. I don't know exactly how long he was gone, but by the time I heard him calling my name the sun was setting. It had been around 6-ish when we got there, which is normally peak daylight that time of year. I then noticed that the family had packed up and were about to drive off and that the tide had come in so much under me, that the stairs that go off the beach onto the docks were submerged almost completely. That's the weird part of the day the rest was just having fun time for his birthday. My reason for posting this is I have no idea what that humming was, it felt like something overbearing and grand, so much that it made me wince from how loud it was, but I didn't feel any pain in my ears at all. Then the way I was fishing weirded me out a bit, Eve ain't never been like that, when I went before, and being like entranced into it, weirds me out as well. Does anyone have any idea what it was or a story similar to it? Here's one I've shared before. It's my uncle's story, and I've heard it a few times from my mom and my aunt, but never from my him directly. Mom has a baby sister. Aunt Leslie. She's much, much younger than my mom and living with us for several years. To give you an idea, she was still in high school when I was in middle school, so she was very young, my grandparents' last kid. Anyway, after she graduated, she met the guy who would be my future uncle, I'll call him Jake. Jake seemed cool. Only one problem, he was a bit of a drinker. My parents are very old-fashioned, and deeply religious. No way that my mom was going to let her baby sister date a guy who drinks. But Aunt Leslie apparently falls for him, and she makes him swear that he'll give up drinking. So mom begrudgingly allows them to date. Some time passes. It's been several months and it's apparent that Jake hasn't curbed his drinking at all, nor does he intend to. Mom tells Aunt Leslie that she's got to break up with him. Aunt Leslie cries but agrees with my mom. She calls Jake. He doesn't answer, but it's a little late in the evening, so Aunt Leslie just assumes he's with his friends. But the next day, Jake shows up at our house. My mom, dad, Aunt Leslie, and Jake have a serious talk. I remember my dad chewed my ass out for running in and out the back door and told me to stay in my room. He looked dead serious, he was never like that, so I did as I was told. After that, Aunt Leslie and Jake are dating again. Eventually they get married. Years later, my mom and I are talking and I bring up that one day they were all having a serious talk. Mom tells me the following story. Oops. I'll wrap it up quickly in the next post. Didn't mean to go on, and on, sorry about that. Mom tells me that that day Jake showed up at our house, he was all shaken up. He had left his house the previous evening. He was on his way to a friend's house, where they were all going to drink. Jake spent most of this particular day at work, so he was totally sober at the time. En route to this friend's house, 
he stopped at a light. This was just outside of a little neighborhood, in a poting part of town, so no real traffic. He's all alone when a car pulls up next to him out of nowhere. Jake is surprised, because he never noticed anyone in his rearview mirrors. He looks over. The car is entirely black, with tinted windows so he can't see inside. Then the window rolls down slowly. As it does, Jake gets a terrible feeling, like something bad is about to happen. At first, there's nothing out of the ordinary. There are two men, the driver is looking straight ahead, the passenger is too, but he turns to look at Jake. The passenger flashes a huge smile and then his face begins to change. Jake could never describe it, but he said the grin stayed visible but everything around it shifted, like the facial features were all moving around, or like the face was twisting it on itself. Jake was frozen, but then he heard the door click open, like the man was about to get out. So Jake floors it and hightails it out of there. Burns rubber all the way back home and locks himself in his room, nobody can convince him to come out. Eventually he manages to sleep and the next day he tells my family what happened was convinced he saw the devil lol. Whatever he saw though, he has never touched a drop of alcohol since. I've posted this before but nobody ever cares. It's 100% true though. Church camp weekend. Me and three brothers hanging out by the water. We're apart from the main campground, the waterfront and camp areas are separated. The sun had just set and we're standing around when a ball of light formed about 10 feet high, it was so bright and moved in a straight line. We all saw it, ran to the car and drove to the campground. Turned out that a girl drowned there a few weeks before, I even saw a ghost that night but I wasn't aware of that at the time. I don't usually tell this one because it's long and I don't like to think about it. I posted maybe once in the succubus thread the last time something happened but no one was helpful. Forgive me if it's sloppy I don't typically post green texts. Be me in 11th grade. Always stay up all night playing vidya or reading about a cult. Mostly read about sigils or pagan stuff. Started watching anime, especially Rosario plus Vampire. Decide it would be fun to read about succubi, because I like the succubus girl from the show. Can't sleep like always but bored of everything else. Decide it would be funny to summon a succubus and ask it to help me go to sleep. Find a website with a ritual. Lights out, candles lit, everything but boxers off. Say a prayer to Lilith asking to send one of her daughters to help me sleep. Envision the anime waifu in my mind because I was a cringe weeb. Roughly a minute passes when I feel off, like the vibe of the room changed. All the hairs on my legs start to stand up, not finding it funny anymore. Ritual said not to open your eyes during the entire encounter, but I panicked and looked. Edge of my bed is a shape of a person, on their hands and knees as if they were crawling to me. Best way to describe how it looked was like TV static but with particles sparking off of it. But shaped like a human. Scream like a coward and pull blanket overhead. Look back and the shape is gone but I see the indent on the mattress still. Nope.jpg Flee the room, sitting in kitchen drinking coffee until school bus comes at 7 a.m. We'll post more in a minute. Okay part 2. I remember that morning telling my friends in school but I could tell that obviously no one believed me. Nothing happened the next night but during that week I witnessed a box of cereal fly off my desk and land upright in the middle of the room. Like it didn't fall it flew and landed straight. And I also woke up that weekend to someone calling my name, but when I got out of bed I was home alone. So from this time, 2013 I think, to 2020 I would occasionally have weird dreams that I think were related to this. I'll share some of those. Walking in mall. Crowds of people everywhere, way more than would be in a mall. Make eye contact with a girl in the crowd has these bright, piercing blue eyes and is smiling at me. Long brown hair and is pale. As soon as I look at her I get a feeling of fear, dread, disgust, etc. I start to walk away but there are too many people in the way and she's coming towards me. Wake up right as she approaches. Here is another. 
walking down my block at night. It's Halloween time the houses are all decorated. At the end of the road a horse-drawn carriage rolls in. I keep walking towards it but the uneasy feeling starts. Carriage opens, and the blue-eyed girl steps out. She's wearing old Victorian clothes, like this dark pink dress. Staring at me smiling again but this time she looks sickly, more pale but almost corpse-like with sunken cheeks. Fight or flight kicks in and I start running away. She gets back in the carriage and riding faster towards me. Right as carriage is behind me I wake up. I had a few more like this. Where the dream out be normal and then she'd show up. Once I noticed it was reoccurring I thought it was like a ghost or something since she wore old clothes. I remember telling my GF at the time about it but she didn't seem to understand and would tell me not to stay up late, or to go to therapy, etc. I'll post the more recent stuff in the next post. This all happened in 2019 to 2020. It will sound retarded in the beginning but it will make sense. Be me doing no nut November in 2019. I did not nut, but as the month went on would become more horny. Started looking at hentai and porn and edging, but always stopping before the nut. Would always go to bed after this, and the next day feel less horny. December 1st is here, I can finally nut again. Realized I developed a porn addiction, will spend every night viewing porn and edging like I was before even though I can nut again. Cannot help myself from it. Always feel compelled to do this every night and feel like shit the next day. 2020 starts and I start having the dreams again. First dream. Walk into my old bedroom from my childhood. It's darker than normal. The woman is standing in the middle of the room, with her arm leaning on a chair. She's fully nude, long wavy brown hair, eyes so blue they almost are glowing like cat eyes, when you shine a light on them, in the dark. Still pale but unbelievably beautiful. She was the most attractive woman I had ever seen. Beckons me toward her but the feelings of disgust and anxiety are back. She comes to me and wraps her arms around my shoulders. Starts whispering things to me. Just give in. Do what makes you feel good. I want to bang you. You should sleep with other women. It's okay to cheat on your girlfriend, you deserve to feel good. I feel disgust but also excitement. I feel sick like I'm betraying my girlfriend with this other woman. Wake up right as I cave and put it inside her. The following night I had this dream. In a hazy and cloudy place like I'm in the sky. The nude woman is there with me. She is very excited and we are touching each other and she is like dancing around me holding my hand. I feel disgust and apprehension again like something is wrong. I ask her what her name is, and she replies with. Azazel. Wake up. I'll wrap it up with this. Obviously I looked up the name and discovered that it's not the name of a succubus, but a fallen angel. This freaked me out for weeks. The dream stopped but I always felt on edge because it went from being weird dreams to having a real name. And I never heard of that name before so it's not like I seen it somewhere and my brain made it up. Then I started thinking that what if the succubus was actually this thing all along. And since I invited it to me it never left. It would come in my dreams over those years. When I did no fap and got addicted to porn, it like, came back. Or it was drawn to me because I was doing something wrong. And that's why the dreams returned but became more intense. With it trying to convince me to cheat on my GF. Like it was targeting me and wanted me to sin. I had my friend pray for me, and I started praying and sleeping with my communion rosary because I was really spooked. I started revisiting church at that time too and since then I haven't had anything else happen. TLDR, I conjured a demon when I was a kid. It would visit me in dreams. Came back for no nut November, then went away. Minor one that happened to me back in 2016. Be me, volunteering in a local anti-drug group in NW Georgia. All the volunteers get invited to a summer cookout and movie night at one of the supervisor's house in the country. Have a good time, dusk is slowly setting in. Most volunteers are watching a movie on the big projection screen they set up in a covered stable area. 
me and a few friends are laying down on a blanket probably 100 feet from the group, looking up at the stars trying to identify constellations. See a small white light that appears to be moving pretty quickly across the sky. Point it out and say something like I don't hear any noise coming from that thing, and it's not blinking so that might be the International Space Station. The light starts to slowly get brighter as it moves. Everyone gets quiet as they're looking up at it the light. Starts to look as if someone is 30 feet above us shining a flashlight directly onto us. Prop myself up semi-surprised, look around to see the light is focused just on the blanket. Listen hard for sound as I thought it might be some weird helicopter thing. A few of us start to get worried and ask WTF is going on as the light is still getting brighter. Just as panic is setting in for us, the light appears to lose interest and dims back to its original glow and continues on through the night. We sit there for a few moments before deciding to go join the others. Nobody else saw it since they were in a covered stable area watching the movie, but my friends verify that this did indeed happen, even years later. Here's an OC. Be me, circa 2007. Standing in line at local grocery store. Buying snacks, etc. for a cross-country road trip. Attractive girl in front of me, age early 20s. Checking her out, lots of tattoos. Notice a chaos magic tattoo on the back of her neck. Know what it is, because I'm into slash x slash shit. Think to myself wow, this chick might be into slash x slash shit. Cool. As soon as I think this, she instantly turns around and looks at me. She starts to act nervous, glancing around. Suddenly an older man, age 35 to 40 comes out of nowhere and joins her, dude looks like pick related. They very hurriedly pay for their couple items and he escorts her out. Stands out as very odd. Oh well, whatever. JPG. Pack up and proceed on cross country road trip. Stop halfway in a motel. That night, 2 am, get a call on my cell phone. This is way before smartphones and the prevalence of spam calls, a call like this is unprecedented for me. Call ID says it's from Langley, VA instantly afraid to answer way freaked out for the rest of the night and trip all of my paranormal spooks have happened after pivotal points in my life especially in my journey towards christianity nine years ago be me 16 years old after some time of being an angsty fedora tipping atheist start to read the bible decide that christianity is the truth Read the Bible daily, pray multiple times a day, try to entice family to embrace Christianity. A few months later. Be me. Still 16. Walk into room after finishing homework. Feel uneasy, different atmosphere, air feels heavy. Walk toward TV. Feel big hand grip my head, palm on forehead and fingers wrapping around my skull. Feel force of the hand pushing me down into the floor as two people have a conversation in an unknown language inside my head. Start trying to say our father prayer and wake up in my bed. A few weeks later. To help you all visualize, I sleep in a bed that has a frame and a headboard. There is an open space about 6 to 8 inches in between. The end of the frame and the start of the headboard. Be me. Sleeping. Abruptly wake up to multiple hands grabbing my hair, neck, and shirt through the open space of my bed frame. Actually see a pale-skinned hand grabbing onto my shirt. Start crying trying to say any prayers I can remember. Everything stops. Fall asleep. Two years ago. Get released from work early. Decide to take a short afternoon nap. Wake up. See the shape of a head under my blanket as I'm laying on my back. Hell yeah GF Suggin on .png. Wait my GF is not in town for the week. Begin to feel heavy, like sleep paralysis is starting to set in, but I can still move my head. Look to my right and spot right hand sticking out of the blanket. Glaring at right hand as I am mustering up all the willpower I can to make a fist. Finally make a fist and turn my head. Shape of the head under the blanket vanishes. The blanket had the shape and then literally fell down as if whatever was under there just disappeared. 
Hi slash x slash. I've been lurking and commenting and bumping for a long time, but I've never shared anything. My experiences aren't that interesting, but I do want to get it off my chest. I grew up in a haunted house. We moved there just after I was born. Weird shit happening was just the norm. Which is probably why I lurk here. So. Be me. 5 to 7 years old. Have my own room. My room was the middle room in the hallway. My parents room was at the end. My brother's room next to mine on the other end. I slept with my door open. My parents door was halfway open. Brother being older closed his. Jerking off and all that. At night you would hear footsteps on the carpeted hallway, faint but with there being no other sound in the house, clear. Footsteps would begin in front of parents' room, walk past my room, stop at my brother's door. Then there would be silence, cold dead absolute silence, for a few minutes before starting all over again. It never walked back, just started at one side, stopped on the other, silence, started back on the other side. Everyone in the house heard this, it was so normal that we'd comment on it the next morning. He was walking again last night. He didn't just walk the hallway, he came into rooms, which as a child is the most terrifying friggin' thing ever. Footsteps would enter room, the room would feel electric, hair would stand up, temperature would drop sharply and you would be paralyzed. It would stand there, and you would hear it standing, I don't know how to describe it. It didn't breathe or talk or anything but you could hear it. My bed was against the wall and I slept with my back to the door. My logic was, I don't want to see it. I know it's there. I feel it, I hear it, but I don't want to see it. Eventually this wore me down mentally, I didn't want to hear it anymore. So I started pressing on my ears. I would place one hand under my pillow and the other over the blanket I had over my face. I pressed so hard that my teeth become malformed in my jaw on the right side, still as to today. I feared night time, I would cry when I had to go to bed. I made up excuses, went to the toilet a million times, anything but be in a dark room being forced to sleep. I wasn't the only one who was visited however. It sat on my brother's bed too many times to recall. It dented in the mattress, sat for a few minutes, got up and left. It lifted my brother's bed up while he was on it. It held my mother down in her bed one night. Apart from walking around and messing with us it just made noise, so so much noise. Cupboards open and closing in the kitchen, plates and cups moving on the kitchen counters, doors opening, doorknobs moving, the usual. Be me. 12 to 14 years old. Got used to it, used to make fun of it by now. Friend comes for a sleepover. His dad came and dropped him off, his dad and my dad are standing outside talking. Mother is washing dishes and talking to me and friend in the kitchen. Mother laughs and says house is haunted. Friend laughs, thinks it's a joke. Mother laughs and says nope. Suddenly the dishwashing liquid bottle flies off the kitchen counter, no one is near it. Friend turns white, nopes the hell out of the house without saying a word. Tries to tell his dad but he isn't making sense. Ended up just crashing at his place because he refused to come into the house again. Older sister came to visit, slept in my room, woke up and saw the shadow of a man sitting next to me on the bed looking at her all night. Older brother came to visit, mom told him house is haunted, he said he didn't believe in stupid shit. He went to take a bath and the tap opened itself, needless to say he slept with the light on throughout his entire visit. Everyone who visited us could write their own green text on that house. The hauntings came in waves. It would be quiet for months and then all hell would break loose. I started having vivid dreams about it. In my dreams it looked like my father but with dead, cold eyes. My dad was still alive so it wasn't him. In my dreams I would look down the dark hallway from the living room and see my dad's face come out of the darkness. Or peer around corners with his expressionless face. What I didn't know at the time was that my father was cheating on my mother, he was verbally abusive but never in front of us, he treated my mother like shit and they didn't love each other. Perhaps I just picked up on the vibes and was projecting it into my dreams. Seeing my dad's Dabelganger watch me from the darkness still makes me feel extremely uncomfortable. 
not a very long or eventful story but spooky at the time. B. Me, age around 20. Shooing with homies at house out in the country. House is run down a little bit, we let people stay there in exchange for them fixing it up to sell but they just wrecked it instead. Primarily just used it as a hangout spot while we slowly cleaned up their mess to sell the house. Hot summer night around 2019 or so, talking around old oil barrel we used to burn things in outside on a gravel driveway at the side of the house. Late at night, around 10.30 or so, way out in the country in East Texas. Conversation dies down a little, we're just having a nice time staring at the fire and thinking campfire thoughts. All of a sudden, coyote noises. MP3. Well I guess there are a lot of coyotes out here and we have a large pasture out behind our house so they're probably just playing or something. Sounds like a lot of coyotes, more than just a couple. Holy shit that's a lot of coyotes, sounds like at least 20. Look in direction of sounds, coming from the thick forest nearby and can't even see to the tree line because it's almost a new moon. Suddenly get severe chills and weird feeling like when you get a sugar rush, like your body needs to expel energy but you are just standing there. Kind of like your muscles have a ton of energy and are primed and ready to go. All friends feel it, we all decide screw it and go inside pretty fast. Had to pick up a friend the next night from his house and drove back at the same time, low fog hanging over the road the whole time and still had that weird spooky feeling in the back of my mind the whole time I was driving scanning the road for something but not sure what. Kind of felt like something was watching us and getting closer, but more like it was just in the vicinity and not directly coming for us.